This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. And by Ledger, makers of the best hardware security devices. Half peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to see the full range of products and use the code EPICENTER at checkout to get 10% off your first order. And by the Bitfinity Conference taking place in Miami Beach from October 30th to November 2nd. Join industry thought leaders, investors, and leading blockchain companies to discuss and showcase how they use blockchains in a wide range of industries. Go to bitfinity.com slash epicenter for discounts on registrations and exhibitor packages. Hello and welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. Today, uh, Meher is at DEF CON, Sebastian is somewhere else, so I'm, I'm all by myself, but fortunately not quite by myself, since uh, Lukas Abek joins me today. He is a visiting researcher at Humboldt University here in Berlin, and he's also a lawyer and doing his PhD in, in law, particularly patent law. And he's been doing a lot of research around uh, 3D printing, where his main thesis is on, but also sort of the, the intersection between 3D printing, blockchain, and, and smart contracts, and, and the kind of legal side of smart contracts. Uh, there was recently an, an interesting article by his on Coindesk, which, of course, we'll link to in the show notes. And, uh, and yeah, so thanks so much for joining us today, Lucas. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so this seems to be a topic we keep coming back to and coming back to and coming back to. I don't know how many uh, episodes we've already done that have fully or partially focused on this idea and question of smart contracts and are they legal? How do they interact with legal contracts? What are their legal implications? It's certainly a, um, a big topic. So when did you become interested in that? I started off as a, as a lawyer in, uh, in IP law, general IP law, copyright, trademark, and, uh, and licensing, and uh, more and more uh, got into IT law, meaning um, outsourcing contracts and software um, uh, development contracts and, and stuff like that. And um, that really got me interested in, in this um, digital realm. And... Um, I uh, did a um, master in uh, IP law in um, Washington, D.C. in 2009, and I visited, uh, uh, attended a copyright, cyber copyright law class, and uh, there was one talk about 3D printing. And ever since, um, I'm thinking about 3D printing and how the digital and the analog world um, collide at some times and uh, or um, intersect and depend on each other. And, and uh, after a year, uh, I decided to write a PhD and uh, really get into that scientifically. And so I came up with the topic of uh, 3D printing and patent infringement. So I imagine in 2009, the must have seen like 3D printing. What is that? Uh, I mean, that must have been an extremely fringe technology. Is that right? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. It was um, not very well known uh, in the wider public. I mean, 3D printing or additive manufacturing, as some like it to call it, um, is, it's been around for some decades. But uh, it was always a very uh, sort of niche uh, for some uh, uh, prototype um, applications. But uh, with the elapse of some patents in the early noughties and um, uh, with uh, increased um, computer power, so better software, the, the additive manufacturing process got um, a wider public and um, so so it um, came along I, I guess so in the early how do you call that tender years <laughs> uh, it, it got just wider public 2010s, 2010s I guess so I'm just, not sure 
<laughs> it just became uh, more, it was not actually not new then, it just became more publicly known. And um, with uh, the, having the experience of uh, copyright being disrupted by digital um, uh, technology, uh, the lawyers were quite alert uh, about uh, new technology disrupting maybe other IP rights, patent rights, um, well, uh, in, in my case, because the patent area is, is not really touched or disrupted or, uh, by the digital technology yet. I mean, there is some question about uh, whether or not uh, software should be patentable subject matter, but well, that's that's pretty much it. The, the most most of the patents are still um, uh, mechanical devices or biotech devices that um, do not uh, they're not interfered with by digital uh, means and uh, software. And I think that might change with uh, 3D printing. Can you explain that a little bit? So what, what, what changes with 3D printing when it comes to patents? 3D printing sits uh, very neatly in the intersection between the analog and the digital world, I'd say. Um, because what you can do with, what you can achieve with 3D printing is, um, for instance, if you just imagine you have a, a physical object, an analog object, uh, that is patented, has a patent on it, it's a, it's a device and it uh, can hold something maybe. And you can scan that device with a scanner and make a digital file of it. And uh, that file, um, if you prepare it for a 3D printer, a 3D printer can print exactly the same device that you previously scanned. So in essence, that allows you to go back and forth from the analog world into the digital world, back to the analog world um, in, in any way, in any direction you want. It's not like uh, with the copyright where, where copying is, is uh, frictionless, more or less, so, and free. 3D printing is costly. And, uh, uh, and it takes time and, uh, and some effort, but still, um, you can change analog things with um, quite easy uh, devices. Scanners are available for for general public at at, at low costs. Three D printers also, and they they improve uh, almost daily. And um, you can make your own copy of a, of an analog device. And uh, that calls for for some concerns, I guess, from from from, uh, from IP law perspective. So it seems to me the implications of that, right? If you can just scan a device and and then print it yourself, and these printers will be everywhere. I mean, then doesn't that mean that copyright, as it pertains to those kind of objects, just is obsolete, doesn't make sense anymore, it's not going to survive? <laughs> A bunch of questions. Um, makes it obsolete? There are actually some lawyers who say, yes, yes, um, it is obsolete. Uh, we, we, lose, uh, we lose control. Uh, all IP laws, copyright and patent laws, to a certain extent, are based on the concept, concept that you have at least certain control over the copyrighted work, like a book, or the patented device, like a machine, and um, and and by uh, exercising that control, you can exercise your right. You can exercise your right to to not uh, 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 sell you a book or so. And uh, in the digital um, world, you have no control over files. I mean, maybe a little, but uh, basically you can send files um, in, um, to anywhere in the world instantly at no cost, no friction, no quality loss, and, and, and that makes you lose 
the control over your device or over your work. And therefore, one might think, think that IP right has no point, there's no point anymore because it's just broke, it doesn't work anymore. Let's get rid of it. Uh, there are people who think that way, maybe. I try to stick to the IP law uh, until we found something better and that, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Okay, interesting. And and what are the big similarities between three um, D printing and and blockchain? How I came about uh, thinking about blockchain and smart contracts is it also uh, sits in the, in the intersection between digital and analog world. Um, I've read uh, there are various de uh, definitions of a, of a smart contract, and um, I I once read one, one that says a smart smart contract makes sense if you can uh, digitalize an analog asset and then put that on a blockchain and um, uh, make commerce with it in, in some way in some way trade it sell it etc. And uh, that kind of struck me that um, with, with uh, blockchain te technology, uh, uh, people try to bridge this gap between digital and analog world. So you studied 3D printing a lot and, you know, understand the issues in, in that area. Uh, with, with there being these similarities to blockchain, do you feel like you've learned something from looking at 3D printing that really makes you understand blockchain in a different way and you know, makes you kind of see, okay, what these people are doing in blockchain, there are some big things that they are seeing in the wrong way and that they need to change their mind about. Are there things like that? I, I guess so. Um, it's a little bit pretentious to say it, uh, that I see big things that uh, other people should see too. But um, uh, what, what I found out about uh, 3D printing is um, this, this notion of information. The definition of information, how we understand information, seems to me uh, quite crucial. And um, what I found out in, in um, uh, about 3D printing and, and patent infringement um, is that um, how the, how the transformation from digital into uh, analog and back, uh, how, how is that, how to describe that, how to, how to capture that in words. Um, and uh, I, I could do that because um, um, I found some definitions of information that... Um, Quite suitable to describe that uh, that process, and um, for for three D printing, it it will be three three aspects of information that are important: structural information, uh, syn uh, syntactic information, and semantic information. Structural information will be the form, the shape of a thing. Syntactic information will be um, the information between uh, for instance, between letters or numbers or uh, other variables, and semantic information will be the content that we as a human, we as human, give uh, to words or to 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 things and 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 what, how we think about and um, a, a certain device or a certain uh, piece item can have several or one layer of or one. Uh, aspect of this information. For instance, a chair has, of course, structural information. You see the shape, but it has also semantic information. If I see a chair, I know I can sit on it. Or if I write a letter, then I see syntactic information, that is the different uh, letters. And, um, uh, I see it's a long, it's a long letter, it's a, it's a lot of uh, different variables on it, uh, and I can also read it. And when I read it, I get the semantic information. Maybe we can take, a, uh, take that a little bit further and make an example. 
to understand how it works with, with the smart contract. The point where I saw this similarity was when this whole DAO heist happened. Uh, we all remember that uh, the DAO was, was a smart contract put on the blockchain uh, that got hacked and, and um, someone used the code in a way that um, it was not intend, intended to use or the, the, the creators of the DAO didn't intend to use. And uh, then I looked at, uh, 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 or so, so talks about what happened and um, the, how the DAO was, was created was, it was pure code. And the idea was actually that everything in the code should be uh, what there is. There's no further uh, legal framework. There's no one that interferes, uh, except with the curators. But um, they had a very small role, the curators. Um, and um, the idea what every, what, uh, was that everything uh, that uh, should rule this DAO is in the language of the code. And um, after the hack, um, people said, well, th that, that's not how, how, how it meant to go. Uh, we, we had other intentions for that. And then I realized that the semantic information, the intent, that wasn't in the code at all. Because if, if it were, it would have worked, right? But it wasn't. So uh, then I, I realized that it is important to, to deal with the notion of information very carefully, uh, to be aware what, what, you actually, what you're actually doing. Let's take a short break to talk about JAX. JAX is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange, which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with JAX, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. JAX supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with JAX, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, JAX makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. JAX works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to JAX.io, that's J A XXX.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for the support of Epicenter. So the intent wasn't in the code. That's certainly true. Do you think there would be potentially a way to do that? Or is that just generally the nature of computers that, you know, one programs them and one wants to do a certain thing, but sometimes that doesn't work out that way and the program ends, doing, uh, ends up doing something else. Isn't that just inevitable part of using uh, computers and technology and code? That is a good question and actually it's a question that um, even philosophers are pondering about and I'm not sure if there is actually an answer. Um, um, there's a, a professor at MIT, uh, um, Noam Chomsky, who is actually a linguist who thinks about these kinds of of questions. Is it, is it possible to have a program that um, uses natural language, that, that, that can process language and, and thinking processes like human beings? And, and he's, he's of the opinion that's not, that's not possible, or not, not in the near future. Other, um, uh, like um, uh, the proponents of, of the singularity say it will be it will be a day where where it is entirely possible to have intent in a computer program and maybe a computer program may uh, have has even the ability to uh, have its its own intent and uh, there's a wide widespread about uh, 
what, what could happen in the future. One of the things that people use, one of the arguments that people use when it came to this DAO hack, but also kind of Ethereum in general, is this idea that, uh, you know, code is law, right? So whatever is written in these smart contracts, that's written what's in these smart contracts. You know, if there's a bug, then there's a bug, right? But that's, that's really what counts. I mean, after all, that's what was written in the DAO website as well. I mean, they wrote some stuff about what it's supposed to do. It didn't end up doing what it was supposed to do, but then they also wrote in there, you know, if there's any discrepancy, uh, the there's no recourse, right? The code is what counts. You sent me an interesting talk that uh, I watched before uh, by a guy named Lawrence Lessig, who's a, a well-known uh, legal scholar. Um, and it was about this idea that code is law. So he wrote this book with that title in a long time ago in 1999, can you talk about what was this idea of code is law back then? What does, what does that term mean? Sure, sure. Um, I think it, uh, code is law, it was coined uh, by Lawrence Lessig uh, in, in this book, 1999. And um, his idea was to look at how we are uh, pushed and pulled in our actions why do we do certain things? And um, he identified more or less um, four factors that uh, um, uh, control or guide our actions. And these four factors would be the law, uh, market, architecture, and norms. Um, the law was, uh, uh, in, in that view, was statutory law criminal law, you should not kill someone. And uh, the market was, of course, um, economic incentives. Um, if I make a buck, I do something. And uh, norms are, with norms, he meant social norms. Uh, if I do something peculiar, maybe people look at me in a weird way and I don't want to have that, so I don't do it. And architecture, uh, he meant that in a quite literal way, like um, uh, if there's a road, you drive on the road. If there's a fence, you don't go over the fence, you go around it. And um, th those factors are influence our behavior, how we do stuff. And what, what he saw is uh, with the emergence and the advent of the internet and more uh, sophisticated software, that architecture um, could also be um, code. I think the, the example is a little bit older, but he used this um, vending machine example. That there's a vending machine, you put a quarter in it and you get a, a Coke. And uh, that's, not, that's not really, really, really a, a, a code, but... Um, code becomes part of, of architecture, how we use software. Uh, in, in, in software, for example, you can um, give a user a selection of possibilities. And you can just choose from what's there. You cannot choose anything else. And that is also kind of architecture in, in the sense lessing meant. And um, so he saw uh, that uh, architecture, architecture can be changed very easily by using code. So he realized that, that code becomes part of architecture. I think it's a very interesting point and where it's also an interesting point, though, is if, if you have uh, code back then, or you know, the structure of the internet, whether that's through hardware and routers and, and stuff like that, or through, uh, I guess, things like web standards and all of those, that they kind of shape behavior, right? That makes sense. But what's interesting, you know, is that today, if you think of it that way, right, the structure of a website kind of steering your behavior in a certain way, when companies are able to you know, in real time, kind of mold the architecture around you to steer uh, your behavior in a certain way, right? With uh, 
maybe change, changing, uh, recommending different products, giving one an offer, like as one is on the website, depending on where one moves the mouse and all things like that. It's, it, it's interesting how that, that power seems to have become bigger and bigger and bigger. Did you see that the same way? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. It, it used to be the case that the law shaped the market, law shaped norms, law shaped architecture, and now it seems to be uh, other way around. That um, it's not uh, the governments that uh, make a law and, and uh, enact a, a statute, and and uh, the architecture is building is built accordingly. It's more the other way around. Architecture is built, and then we have to find a law uh, that uh, um, tries to to capture what's happening. If, if, if it captures that at all. So is, is that just because uh, things are changing quicker and you know, it's hard for law and regulation to keep up with that change because you know, the speed of that changing hasn't increased in the same amount or is there something else going on here? That is crucial part, I guess, yes. It's, um, building software is very, uh, very easy and, and can be done quite quickly and uh, uh, enacting a bill is very cumbersome and take, takes a lot of time. And uh, that is a discre discrepancy that, that uh, certainly um, propelled that shift from, from law to architecture. And if there was, you know, if code was law back then, and, and it kind of, I think it makes sense to sort of understand how that's the case in terms that it, it created certain constraints in moving behavior, um, is there anything different about smart contract code? Is that law in a different way? Well, what, what I've seen when I read uh, articles or, or posts about smart contracts is that the uh, notion of code of code is law um, changed somewhat in, in the direction that code is everything. And that was certainly not what Lessing meant back in, in 1999 in, in his book. I'm a little bit under the impression that it is just uh, used in a very exaggerated way that people think uh, we have uh, even so much power that with software everything is possible and the, the code is law, is, is all there is and, and it's all almost almighty. And um, that is certainly not the case, I'd say. What I thought was very interesting about Lessig's talk is that he talked about this code is law in this descriptive way, right? He said, okay, that's just a factor that has to be taken into account when it comes to understanding what shapes human behavior. But then he also made the argument really uh, more of a moral ethical argument that code that law should be shaping uh, code and architecture and essentially I think if I understood this argument correctly it was that a, a law is in a way sort of at the top right and then law directly shapes behavior by saying for example murder is illegal you're going to go to jail but also by uh, having property law and things like that and those shape uh, like the economic environment that creates the markets that then shape behavior and then to some extent shaping uh, social norms, although of course there's maybe a discussion whether it's more social norms shaping law than the other way around, but to some extent uh, laws can shape uh, social norms. Uh, I think the, the example Lessig made was uh, in smoking, smoking bans that have certainly played a part in making uh, this a stigmatized activity. Uh, and then his point being like, but it, you need the same kind of effect on architecture and, and on code. And if that's, if that's kind of not possible anymore because code becomes bigger and bigger and, and laws aren't able to shape that area and influence that area, it becomes this space where there's no influence of law, which he seems to view as a, as a very negative thing. Do you share his view on this? I do share his view on this in the sense that um, 
it creates a certain void that needs to be filled. I, I do agree with the, with, with, the, with the large picture of, 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 of Lessig. And, uh, and what I also, also think is that um, um, code cannot escape the law. It's not something that is outside the law, outside the world. I mean, we can, we can um, go back to, uh, to the advent of the internet and uh, the Declaration of Independence that um, Gary Barlow um, famously wrote, one of the founders of the um, Electronic Frontier Foundation. He said, well, we are in the cyber, I'm paraphrasing, uh, we're in the cyberspace and no one can, can reach us here in the cyberspace. And, and as we have seen, this is not true. Cyberspace and, and, and law and law enforcement and people are very much intertwined still. And uh, for, that's actually the reason why I think regulation and, and code should still interact. And uh, code should not, at least for, for now, should not um, be completely separate from, from regulation. And we should, um, as um, developers of, of, of uh, such technology, um, we should embrace the, the, the legal world and try to shape the architecture of code with, 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 the, with the legal world. Let's take a break to talk about the Ledger Nano S, the new flagship hardware wallet by Ledger. I'll let Ledger CEO, Eric Larchevêque, tell you all about how simple the Nano S makes it to securely store all your private keys. The Ledger Nano S is our latest generation hardware wallet. This is a multi-currency hardware wallet. It has a screen and buttons to manage everything on screen. You can generate a new seed, restore a seed, or set up your pin on the device your seed will never be exposed to the host computer. On the Nano S, you have different apps. You have the Bitcoin app, you have the Ethereum app, and you have the Fido U2F app for strong authentication, for instance, with Google, Dropbox, or GitHub. You can manage your cryptocurrencies with the Ledger Wallet Bitcoin Chrome app or the Ledger Wallet Ethereum Chrome app with the Nano S, all your Bitcoin and Ethereum addresses are derived from one unique seed. With one seed, you can have in the same time Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic balances. And also, if you restore your seed, you will also recover all the keys associated to other apps such as Fido U2F, SSH, GPG. So it's very simple, just one seed and multiple applications. The Nano S sets the new standard in hardware wallet security and usability. You can get yours today at ledgerwallet.com. And when you do, be sure to use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER. What I found striking about uh, that, that statement, that uh, you know, cyberspace declaration of independence, and I, I only just watched uh, a little bit of that that was shown as part of Lessig's talk, but uh, maybe we'll also link to the whole thing. This is a long time ago that this was done. And it seems like there's this idea there, this vision that you're going to have this um, kind of libertarian dream of, of a space of freedom where you know, people can do what they want and there's no infringement and, and there's no reach for uh, the government, for power and for uh, those kind of insti you know, current institutions. And, and that, if you look at it from today's perspective, obviously didn't happen. Um, you know, I think the Snowden, the Snowden cases uh, illustrate that illustrate that very well that that didn't happen at all. And then if you look at it today, we have a little bit of a similar thing again, right? Where you have people. Um, in the crypto space, right, where a lot of people think that what blockchain is going to reach, and I think in, in Ethereum it's very prevalent, right, this idea that we're going to have this uh, the space where people can run their application, do their thing, enter their smart contracts, etc. And there's no, uh, there's no reach, there's no ability for anybody or for the government to, to interfere there. 
And I wonder if that's going to turn out the same again, right? That we're going to look back and it's like, oh no, that didn't happen at all. It really didn't turn out that way. I fear a little that it's going to happen uh, over again, all over again, same way it happened with uh, the internet and, and um, uh, declaration of independence. One reason why I think that's going to happen is, um, from my perspective, um, uh, as a lawyer, um, I, th I think it's very interesting that people think, a smart, for instance, a smart contract should be the same as a contract. I mean, um, it begins with smart contract uh, very often, let's say, uh, with smart contracts, you can reach this independence. Um, but um, when we look at what a smart contract is and, and compare that to a um, classic legal contract, they might they may seem uh, similar, but actually, there's um, from a legal point of view, there's a whole lot more to a legal contract than. Uh, uh, what you get with a smart contract. For instance, if, you, if I want to make an example, I have a legal contract with you, I say I sell you X for the price of Z. That is not all there is to that contract because if I don't sell you uh, the, the item or the item is defective, you can um, um, go to a court and you have rights according to a sales statute and all that that there is a court and the sales statutes that's not all that's all not in the contract you don't write that up in a contract right but it is still there and with smart contracts that's that's somehow lacking that's one reason why i think the the code cannot escape law or the 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 world and and be completely independent couldn't you say that the, the actual protocol rules themselves take on a little bit that role? So in, in, in you know, the rules of how transactions get added, what's valid, who can... It can absolutely take a, a little bit of the control. In, in, in particular, I think it, it can take control of, of the execution of a contract. When we think about, um, let's say... Um, Financial derivatives, that, that's very common for, for, for a smart contract. Uh, if it just um, have to buy, uh, sell you some digital asset and uh, that needs to be deducted from my book and added to your book, etc. That can be done with, with code very easily and very uh, successfully. And that's really good. Uh, code can take that part of, uh, of a contract. But what code cannot do is uh, is judging something for instance that's what a court would do like um, code cannot judge if, if an, a certain item is defective or not or hardly uh, for that you you still need uh, a human to to look at it and here we come full circle with my uh, idea about uh, the information having several aspects of defectiveness of an item, for instance, it is really, really hard to um, capture that in code, if not impossible at all. And uh, as long as, that's, as that is not possible, code cannot escape uh, the analog world and therefore cannot escape the law. I think the point you're making is a very interesting one from another perspective as well. Because if you make this contract today, right, we make a simple contract saying, yeah, I sell you a certain thing. And then there's all this back stuff to rely on, right? So first of all, we probably both have some understanding of contracts, right? We've, we've signed various contracts before. I mean, I'm sure you have a much better understanding, but I still have some understanding of what the contract is. And then there are these existing you know, police to go to, lawyers to call on who understand it. There's like uh, common agreed norms around this, even social norms. But then, of course, there's also the court where one can enforce it. And then one goes away and goes into the smart contract world. And then there's nothing of that, right? There's all of that is basically gone. And so if I wanted to make uh, an employment contract, 
using smart contracts, in a way, it almost would require you to recreate all of this stuff that all of a sudden you can't rely on anymore, which seems like an extremely hard task and which would kind of imply that you really shouldn't even try for any complex contract, like, like for example, let's say an employment contract, maybe at least for, for a while until you have, you know, there is some tools and experience and, and norms around that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I would consider an employment contract as a rather simple contract. And even that is difficult, as you mentioned. And, but the thing is, um, it, it is, it is a really big task to incorporate the whole law into code. And I'm, I'm not sure if that's, even, if that's even possible or even desirable. I think there's two, there's two things about that. One would be that um, you can just change the law, make it more simple, and, um, uh, and then you, it's easier to, to capture uh, contracts in, 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 um, uh, in, in code. For instance, don't, don't, don't mention things about material breach because nobody knows what a material breach is. is. Just use it for simple contracts that, that, has, uh, that have no um, element of judgment or no difficulties. A little bit like um, Bitcoin. It's, Bitcoin in itself is not, not a smart contract, but what they do is just um, adding and subtracting. And that's basically the simplest of all tasks, I guess. You can't get any less simple than having or not having. And, and, and with that, it, it works brilliantly. It works absolutely brilliantly. And um, uh, you want to have the judgment element uh, uh, on, a, on a other technology or another, another way. That's, that's an interesting point. And maybe that is part of the reason why Bitcoin is the one, still, you know, the one blockchain application that actually, you know, has some usage. Today's magic word is intention. That's I-N-T-E-N-T-I-O-N. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Another point that I find interesting here, and, and that's Lessig's talk, it really, I thought, was quite striking in some ways. And so if we, if we think of now smart contracts happening and we have this space where people can really just sort of directly enter contracts with each other and there's no uh, restrictions, then what does that mean, right? So first of all, of course, it will mean less restrictions on what people can do, right? The same regulations that they don't uh, have their effect anymore. You know, to give an example, if you're going to have some sort of, a, you know, I'm going to sell my time for some money or something like that, essentially employment thing, right? So children could, you know, sell their labor. Nobody would know, right? There's no way to enforce that. Or, or you could have contracts that are very, very one-sided that might not be enforceable. But if it's in smart contracts, well, you know, it's like you cannot, the, the Ethereum blockchain is not going to say this isn't fair. Like, it is an interesting point. You no, know? to what extent is that a good thing? And to what extent is it a bad thing? I mean, I think certainly the vast majority of people in the blockchain space and especially sort of traditionally in the blockchain space and in the Bitcoin space really viewed this as a positive thing. They viewed the, the decreased ability of governments to regulate as, as a great thing, as increasing freedom, as really the whole point of this technology. And then uh, there is a question, right? With less six thing, it's like, well, but that's actually a negative thing. And I'm not... Sure, I'm probably somewhere in the middle. I think it's mostly a good thing that the government can't, but then obviously uh, it can also be a bad thing. Uh, so it's a, I think it's an, interesting, it's an interesting point. It will be interesting to see how this turns out. It, it, it is absolutely. Regulation is a sword that cuts, that cuts both ways, right? Um, we've, we've made some um, uh, experience with bad regulations, 
everybody of uh, uh, some somehow experienced that that some laws or some regulation interfered with your um, personal intentions or, or what you think that um, uh, your freedom should should be and uh, so we perceive regulation as something bad generally but we take sort of granted that regulation can be good as well and sometimes we forget about that and um, what what uh, what's important I guess uh, is that we recall that a regulation can be a good thing and um, another aspect about regulation that I, uh, I would um, I would like to mention is that if you don't want to be regulated there's there's several ways you can go about it and um, I mean why, why does uh, a government regulate something that would one uh, reason would be because terrible things happen and then the government thinks no that shouldn't that should be happening I, I regulate that or a, a big player uh, does some lobbying about regulation. So the, the first part, um, there is a, a lot we can do about uh, from a technology perspective. If we um, try to make uh, blockchain secure and come up with um, uh, our own regulations in the sense of uh, best practice, for instance, or what we've seen uh, recently is um, tools that, that prove your code after this whole uh, DAO experience. Um, there's a, a, a greater concern about security. It, it's a, a greater concern about government, how, how to, or the governance, how to govern blockchain applications, blockchains in general, how to run a blockchain and if we, if we take that in our own hands and uh, uh, try to um, not mess up things and not produce failures where people lose money or even worse then the authorities and the governments or they are inclined to uh, regulate less or no that's that's an interesting point i mean it seems to me like today at this point they're not regulating primarily because they don't understand what's going on and things seem to be changing too quickly so they're like oh, absolutely. we don't know what to do absolutely yeah and and that might not change so quickly right i mean with with bitcoin of course they did try to do some regulation i mean even with bitcoin that didn't seem to get very far and bitcoin of course is vastly simpler to understand and try to regulate than something like smart contracts, which is this very general concept that can be applied in all kinds of different ways. And there is not even an agreed upon definition of what a smart contract is. To that question, there's uh, interesting that a lot of, let's call big players like banks are involved in blockchain technology. And I would assume that uh, governments don't want to interfere too much with big banks because um, they're taxpayers and um, they have uh, good lobbyists who look out for their clients. And we can maybe take a little bit advantage of that and try to come up with um, uh, best practices and, and maybe even self-regulation um, tools and, and, um, and use that, that, um, um, that fact that, that big players are interested in blockchain and, and keep the, the government a little bit off our, off our chest. Let's take a short break to talk about Bitfinity, the Miami blockchain conference to be held this year from October 30th until November 2nd. Blockchain technology has been exiting the world of nerds and hackers and entering the mainstream. We're at the beginning of a big revolution that's going to fundamentally change how the world works. At the Bitfinity conference, we're going to have the heavyweight speakers such as Don Tapscott, who wrote the book The Blockchain Revolution, or Joe Lubin of the startup Consensus. 
but we're also going to have the industry panels that focus on real world use cases and bring together both the tech expert who really understand blockchain and the kind of key decision makers that will help blockchain become a real commercial success. Now, you may just want to pack your bags and buy a ticket to Miami, and that's certainly a good idea. But if you're involved in a project or startup, there's something even better. Bitfinity will feature dozens of presentations by starting startups, so you can apply for the presenter package, get an exhibitor stand, and speak on the main stage to an audience of 500 to 1,000 high-level people, including many VCs and top decision makers. And of course, all that while sipping a martini in a luxury hotel in Miami Beach where Frank Sinatra once sang on stage. To learn more how you can join startups like Factum, Consensus, Everledger, and Stellar. Visit them at bitfinity.com slash epicenter and find out how you can get 10% off the company presenter package or your $200 discount code to attend. We'd like to thank Bitfinity for their support of Epicenter. So let's briefly talk about a last topic here. You mentioned, um, I think also in the article, alternative dispute resolution. My understanding is basically you have a contract and there's some sort of clause in there if there's disagreement it goes to some sort of little special tribunal that's going to give a decision as opposed to going through a regular court, which presumably can be much faster and, and maybe there's more certainty than with regular court and stuff. Is that, is that roughly an accurate description of, of what those are? Roughly saying yes, it is. Um, it's called alternative dispute resolution, and the alternative is is uh, is meant quite literally. Um, it is the alternative to the, to the traditional court system. And um, what you can do is, uh, if you sign a contract, for instance, you can um, insert a clause that says, uh, uh, if a dispute arises out of this contract. I don't want to go. Uh, uh, I don't want to resort to a civil court or whatever court that would have uh, jurisdiction over that contract. I want uh, to have a um, arbitration panel that uh, judges the, the happening, or judges the, the the contract, and judges what 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 the parties performed or not performed. Um, uh, I agree on a set of rules how we deal about, and those rules can um, can be defined um, uh, pretty much freely. There's there's not a lot of cons not a lot of constraints to how those rules um, need to be shaped, and um, maybe maybe uh, a, a good example to understand the concept is um, the. If you register a domain name with your local registrar, um, you are subjected to the arbitration rules of that um, uh, registrar, and that sets forth how you deal, how it is um, dealt with a domain name if it is infringing um, trademark, for instance. For instance, that, that uh, says that if, if there's a train trademark infringing um, claim about a domain name, it goes to a panelist, and the panelists panelist um, judges the, the case. And if the panelist says there is an infringement, I'll take back that uh, domain name and, and delete it. For instance, uh, that's that's uh, something the um, registrars came up with to deal with domain name um, hacking or squatting or whatever you call that. And what I envisioned is that could, be, that could be useful for smart contracts too. If you have a smart contract that says, um, I sell you X and um, uh, you pay me Y, and um, then this whole transaction performs, and um, you think X is defective, then we need a panelist who, uh, who is arbiter about whether or not something is defective and, and executes the judgment that we've been talking before. And you can set up that in, in, in more or less simple rules and, and you can say what it is that is uh, disputed. You can uh, say uh, what 
uh, parts of the contract should be subjected to, what are not subjected to, to um, those rules, and you have you have a whole lot of freedom to to decide that. And I think that that would be a wonderful tool to explore um, uh, and and to uh, uh, to add to smart contracts. That's a very interesting point, particularly also because today, right, people if there's some sort of smart contracts being created and then if if there's a possibility that it would go to court one of the problems today would be that it would go in front of some lawyers who wouldn't have a clue what on earth is going on and it would be very unpredictable like what kind of what would they do with that with that kind of evidence or with what's going on in a smart contract so if one could have some of these alternative dispute resolution courts that really are focused and specialized in smart contracts and blockchain technology that really understand this, then that could, and that maybe can develop some kind of standards in terms of how do you handle disputes in this world. And I, but that does sound like a very interesting and intriguing um, approach. I, I think so too, yeah. I, um, I think it would be worthwhile to, to have a closer look if, um, if, the details play out the way that this this thought is um, uh, uh, started. I've 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 not uh, written rules down or, or explored anything of that uh, in greater detail. But I I think um, it should be possible and details could be sorted out. And uh, w one of the beauty uh, beautiful aspects of that would be that is. That is actually legally binding. If you have a, a, a judgment from such a, 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 a panel, if you do it correctly and, and the rules are um, good enough to, uh, to meet uh, the rule of law standard or whatever is um, uh, mandatory for the jurisdiction you're in, then it is, a, it is a actual judgment that can be enforced, enforced by police if necessary, and um, that would help to um, um, not get not become a digital wild west, and um, that would be uh, an, an effort towards what I've mentioned before: this uh, regulation and self-regulation uh, um, theme, where you can. Um, where you put up your own regulations, and so you make sure that the governments don't interfere in a way that that destroys the whole innovation and the whole uh, um, the whole new technology. And also, uh, what's uh, what's uh, interesting is um, there's there's a lot of um, concepts, uh, technology-wise concepts uh, around about. Um, um, how decisions should be taken. Um, for instance, we, we've seen uh, prediction markets, uh, a podcast about that on, on Epicenter TV. Um, there's other um, other efforts that I've um, read about. Um, uh, uh, it's called uh, Backfeed, and that's uh, about value creation and um, and also reputation. For instance, if you wanna. You have to decide who should sit on a panel, who should be panelists. You can use technology, and um, uh, people who interact in a positive way in the environment of blockchain may get some reputation. And you can use technology to create that reputation and handle that reputation. And then you already have a, uh, have a use of, of, of um, or you 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 can use that to define who, who should be a panelist. And that's a, a, a wonderful playing field for, for those uh, ideas and, and approaches, I guess. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for, for coming on today, Lucas. Now, uh, one last question. What kind of research questions around blockchain and smart contracts are you most interested in and are you planning to explore in the next year or a few years? Well, um, first of all, I have to finish my PhD. Uh, uh, there's still a lot of work to do, but um, I think being a lawyer, uh, the idea of uh, dispute resolution 
um, rules for smart contracts, that would be that would be very interesting to go into more details if that's actually feasible, uh, if that's if that's actually achievable, and how can uh, how it could be intertwined with smart contracts. And um, I, I would be happy to to do more research in that that direction. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Um, it was it was a pleasure talking to you, and I look forward to, to some of that research, particularly also around around that concept, because that's certainly an interesting one and and one that could be very very important. And where I actually haven't seen um, a lot about this idea, so that that would be fantastic. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so with that, we're at our end. Uh, Epicenter is part of the LTB network. You can find this show and many others on letstalkbitcoin.com. Um, and yeah, so we put out new episodes every Monday. You can subscribe to the show both on uh, YouTube, uh, on youtube.com slash epicenterbitcoin, or you can download it and subscribe to it in any of the favorite podcast apps there are. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.